I'm delighted to be able to introduce to you a dear friend, Richard Gordon, who's agreed to be interviewed uh, today, Remembered Sunday. Richard, thank you so much for agreeing to put yourself through this. Would you just like to tell us a little bit about yourself and your family? Rupert, thank you very much for inviting me. It's lovely to be here uh, and welcome everybody. I, um, I first met Rupert about 20 years ago when I was just leaving the army uh, and we became very, very close friends since then. Um, I live here in Salisbury with my wife, Rachel. Uh, we have two sons, both quite grown up now, 25, 27. Uh, one's gone into the foreign office and one does computer coding. And since leaving the army, I've been working here um, in the southwest of England, based out of Bournemouth University, teaching disaster management to countries around the world. I've, I've always been actually rather curious, Richard, to know exactly what you did do when you were in the army. Can you tell us that? <laughs> well, I joined the army after leaving university. Um, I suppose many would have said it was inevitable. My father had been a lifelong soldier. Um, but throughout my university years, I assumed I was, I was going to have a very different career. I was aiming for something quite different. And it wasn't really until my final year at university that some research had required me to spend time with the army for a dissertation I was writing. And it was during that time that I felt that the Lord was telling me clearly, this is where he wanted me to be. So I joined something called the Royal Army Education Corps and spent the first two years with the Scottish Infantry Division based in Aberdeen. Uh, and was then posted to the Brigade of Gurkhas in the Falklands, Hong Kong, Nepal, and then back to the UK. Uh, it was during my time with the Gurkhas I met Rachel, um, and she had just joined a, a missionary organization based in Nepal. A mutual friend asked us to get together so I could tell her about what to take to Nepal for an 18 month stay. I just made more and more things up in order to keep on seeing her. And while she was in Nepal, I was posted to various operational units and deployments overseas. And then we were married in 1990. We had an extraordinary first year in Windsor with the Blues and Royals before traveling to Germany for several years. And I suppose it was shortly after we returned to the UK that the Lord clearly said to me, the time's come to leave the army and to follow him into a new career, which it emerged became disaster management. Uh, Richard, today the whole country stops and it is Remembrance Sunday and I, I be so interested to hear what you think when you think of Remembrance Sunday. Well, for me, it reminds me of the men and women who gave their lives during the First and Second World Wars, primarily, uh, but then also in Korea, Bosnia, Iraq, Afghanistan, so many other conflicts elsewhere. And each year, Remembrance Sunday reminds me to stand silently in awe in awe of their courage and their selflessness, and to try to promise that their sacrifice won't be forgotten or trivialized. But I suppose Remembrance Sunday also reminds me of God's mercy to us as a nation and our need to commit ourselves as another generation to call upon God's mercy and grace, uh, particularly right now in this time of pandemic. Hmm. The stunning truth that we all face this morning anyway is that no matter how heroic any soldier or airman or sailor or emergency responder can be. They can't substitute their life for you, for you or me in such a way that we can stand forgiven by God. And that, the only way for that was for Jesus to become one of us and take upon himself the punishment. Thank you. Yeah, that was very, very good. I think that's, a, that's the best short interweaving <laughs> of, um, of the two themes I've ever heard. We play that every year. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. Um, I'd love to know more, Richard, about if there's been particular times when your faith has played a, a, a particularly significant role in your life. Yes, uh, there have. Um, I suppose I need to start by saying that both my parents were Christians. Uh, they had a deep love for the Lord. And I became a Christian uh, at quite a young age at a Billy Graham crusade in London. Um, but then I allowed the sport of rowing to become more important to me. And my goal was to be in the first eight. However, I became injured during training, was told I'd never walk without a crutch again. Uh, and during the following months, I found I needed to rediscover my love for the Lord and 
it was at that time that I was filled with his spirit in a way that I'd never known before. And I sort of ceased to worry about walking physically. They still carried on telling me I would need to have a crutch. And I found myself thinking more, I just want to walk in a way that pleased God. And then during a school half-term holiday at home, I woke one morning uh, with a sense that God wanted to heal me. Um, and my mother confirmed that day that she'd had the same sense while she was praying. And so we got down on our knees to pray and she prophesied over me. She said, my son, rise up and walk. And now it's really difficult when your parents say, my son, rise up and walk. Who, who's, who's talking, her or the Lord? And I was petrified to stand up. I, I didn't want to try walking in case I wasn't healed. But my mom was from Ulster. You don't argue with people like that. So she, you, you just do exactly what you're told to do. And I, yeah, I, I stood up and I was healed. And I rode again and it, I was in the first date. All of that was now secondary, knowing that I could walk with him. Wow. And, it, and it was walking with him that naturally led me to walk, follow him into the army. The only way I can put it is, why am I in the army? God was walking there and I wanted to walk with him. He just led me in there. And it was a very natural next step. And as soon as I found myself in the army, I found those who loved him. And I found myself fellowshipping with people. And you only have about one opportunity in your regiment or whatever you join to say that you're a Christian. You only, you only get one opportunity. And after that, you don't have any other opportunities because they just talk about it and they want to watch and watch and watch how you live. So I just wanted to share with you two times in the army where I found that my faith was particularly uh, tested in, in a new way. Um, the first one was when I was, funnily enough, still at Sandhurst. I, I was thinking about, there's a number of stories, but this is the one I, I just wanted to share. When I was still at Sandhurst, we were on a live firing exercise in Wales, and that requires a lot of uphill running, firing live ammunition at targets that rise out of the ground. And what you do is you, so you exercise in pairs. And the idea is you go to ground together, fire, get up together, run, get down and so on. And my colleague tended to fall slightly behind me all the time. Um, and eventually he ended up falling right behind me. And he pulled the trigger to fire around without realizing that he was actually pointing it directly at the back of my head. And that crucial round jammed in the mechanism. Now, that was a wonderful miracle, and, and we, we had a conversation about that, he and I. But three days later, I spoke with my <laughs> I'm, I'm being quite sort of English about it, I suppose. But three days later, I spoke with my parents, and my mother told me that uh, my former landlady, for when I was at Cambridge University, uh, my former landlady had phoned to say that her young son, who I used to play with, he was about six or seven at the time, and because I knew I was going into the army, we used to sort of practice um, leopard crawling around the house and so on. Anyway, he'd come down, age six or seven, down to breakfast and announced that God had spoken to him in a dream that night and told him to get the family to pray for me as I was in danger. So mum, daughter, son, sat around the breakfast table and they prayed for me. They didn't have a clue why. And then later she phoned my mother. And my mother had no idea why either. But after I spoke to her, she then understood. And we loved telling the family, and in particular, telling the son how faithful he had been and how the Lord had heard their prayer and honoured it. Now go forward eight years and the son is now like me, rebelling against his faith in the Lord, like, that, like I was when I was a teenager, far away from any sense of Christian testimony. And I was asked to speak at a young adults group for young men in Guildford. And without my knowing it, the son was actually at that event at the back of the room. Neither of us knew we were going to be there. And I shared my testimony. And one of the things I shared was this story about how the Lord had spoken to a young boy and had got him to pray with his family to save me from a certain bullet. And unknown, he was back at this room, tears of repentance, coming back to the Lord and learning to walk again. So for me, that was the most extraordinary example, not just of, of faith, but the way that our faith is, is served by other people and then comes around and serves. It's the most extraordinary way that the Lord uses different situations. The second story, very quickly, was when I was serving with the Gurkhas in Nepal. And I was trekking around the hills of Western Nepal with a small group of soldiers uh, from my regiment, uh, second, second Gurkhas. 
and we were visiting some of our retired soldiers back in their villages. And one of the Nepalis that was traveling with me became very weak and he looked unlikely to go much further. And when we asked him, what's wrong? He finally told us he was suffering from perpetual fear because every night when he went to sleep in his tent, he was visited, he said, by an evil God who said he was going to kill him. And I asked him, would you like to know the name of a much stronger God that would frighten this other God away? And he replied, yeah, yeah, of course. Is there one? What's his name? I said, Jesus. So what, what, do, you, what do I say, he asked. And not yet being properly theologically trained, I said, try saying, go away in Jesus' name. The following morning, he was completely transformed. He was healthy, strong, ready to go. And I asked him what had happened. And he said, during the night, the evil God had uh, come to him and he had used the words that I'd given him. Go away in Jesus' name. And, and then he just slept. And later that day, we were walking down a valley in a small village into Western Nepal. And this man was now teaching all the others in the group how to defeat evil spirits by shouting out in English, go away in Jesus' name. So, so they, were all, they were all learning to shout out in English, go away in Jesus' name, over and over again. But the problem was that at the bottom of the hill, there was a group of German tourists <laughs> who thought they were shouting at them. <laughs> what an amazing story. What an absolutely amazing story. And by the way, I don't think theological training would have improved what you told the man. I think it was absolutely spot on. Let's move to the next question. Richard, I, I can't help wanting to slightly stray away from Remembrance Sunday and um, pick on your worldwide experience as someone who travels the world in uh, helping people to cope with disasters. And when you see all that's going on globally, and we can see you are not experts at so many trying things going on, how do you keep going? And um, do you get depressed every day or how, how do you cope? I think, I think what saddens anyone who works in disaster management is that so many of the events that end up being called natural disasters by the media are not natural at all. There are obviously natural hazards, earthquakes, hurricanes, volcanoes, uh, but it's the impact of these hazards on people and their livelihoods. It's usually a result of man-made decisions or national and local governance, or a lack of national and local governance. Um, so a lot of our work is, is working with government ministries in countries around the world, helping them to take responsibility and, and indeed become accountable for what we might call national risk reduction, instead of sort of laying or offsetting the responsibility onto relatively junior agencies to try and sort it out. One of the things that keeps me from ever becoming depressed is there are so many Christians in disaster management. In the same way, there were so many Christians in the army. And indeed, many of the people I've worked with in disaster management are former soldiers, sailors, and airmen. They continue to choose to serve in other ways outside of the military. Um, there are some, of course, the other thing too, there are amazing stories of heroism and sacrifice in disaster management. Ordinary people put their own lives at risk to save other ordinary people. I think of the Frenchman on a motorbike going in and out of the Mont Blanc tunnel during the tunnel fire. Uh, just going in, rescuing people from their cars, taking them out, going in again, a smoke-filled tunnel. He went in and out, I think about four to five times, and on the sixth, sixth, sixth time, he didn't return. He was overcome by the fumes. But he saved so many lives in doing that. And then we only need to think today of the people who work in our NHS hospitals and their clinics and our other outreach centers. These extraordinary events bring out extraordinary courage, resourcefulness, and yes, sacrifice of people helping one another. They'll never be mentioned in the news. They'll never be recognized with awards. They just do it because it needs to be done. So for me, I suppose Remembrance Day is a wonderful day to remember the heroism and sacrifices made by others so that we can live. Mm -hmm. And I, I would love to ask you this question because I have a personal interest in the answer. I'm always trying to learn from other people. And the question I want to ask is, Richard, what do you do to keep your spiritual life alive? It very obviously is alive and a really important part of your life. Um, what tips have you got to pass on? 
<laughs> I, I thought long and hard about this one, Rupert. Um, I think my personal tip for Remembrance Sunday on 2020, because it would probably change the day after, I think my personal tip would be some words from George Muller, the 19th century missionary in Bristol, who said this, the first great and primary business to which we need to attend every day is to keep our souls happy in the Lord. I mean, what does that mean? And so Muller sort of answers that question by saying, as the outward man is not fit for work for any length of time unless he eats, so it is with the inner man. What is the food for the inner man? The word of God. Not the simple reading of the word of God, so that it only passes through our minds, just as water runs through a pipe. No, we consider what we read, we ponder over it and apply it to our hearts. Now, when I was courting Rachel, she was working in Nepal and I was working in the UK and there were no mobile phones and the only way we could communicate was by letter. So I wrote regularly to Rachel, literally very, very often. Um, in fact, it was an indication to my parents that I was finally in love, that I was actually writing letters. And I poured myself into those letters and I loved getting her replies. And when we finally married, I was amazed at how well she seemed to know me. And when I asked, she said, well, because you told me about yourself in the letters. So my tip today is this. I write letters to the Lord every day, short ones but I tell him what's going on in my life. I tell him what I'm struggling with and what I thank him, and I can thank him for answers to prayers that I've seen. And I basically pour out my heart to him on paper. And in doing that, it forces me to think through clearly what I'm actually thinking and processing. And then having done that, I then read the chapters from the Bible for that day, and I look for God's reply to my letter. I've poured out my heart to him, and now I look for his response. And day by day, I find that the verses that I read lead me to repent or to receive encouragement or to rejoice and give thanks or to purpose to do something in obedience to his word. So the Bible becomes less of a book to read and study and more of a time of listening to the one who alone knows me inside out. I, I just want to say thank you very much indeed, Richard. It's been really a privilege for me to hear your answers uh, to questions I've been longing to ask for years. And I'm just so grateful to you that you uh, allow us to interview you like this. And also just to tell you how inspiring it is to hear from you about how your faith remains absolutely up front and central part of your life. So thank you so much. God bless. Thank you, Rupert. God bless. Bye for now. Bye.